On behalf of our festival co-directors, Namika Gokhale and William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to GLF's Brave New World. Those of you who missed our earlier sessions with some of the greatest writers of the world, including Erling Kage, Professor Abhijit Banerjee, and Esther Duflo, Ruskin Bond, Elizabeth Gilbert, and so many others, you may catch these on our Facebook page, GLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest GLF. Our official radio partner, is Red FM Bajati Raho. Our session today on GLF's Brave New World is on Chapel Sands, my mother and other missing persons. Laura Cumming in conversation with William Dalrymple. August 1929, a young girl is kidnapped from a beach. Five agonizing days go by before she's discovered safe and well in a nearby village. The child remembers nothing of these events and at home, Nobody ever speaks of them again. Decades later, Laura Cumming delves into the mystery surrounding her mother's disappearance, examining everything from old family photos to letters, tickets, and recipes. She uncovers a series of secrets and lies perpetuated not just by her family, but by the whole community, and in doing so, unlocks a mystery almost a century old. She is in conversation with William Dalrymple. Laura Cummings is the author of The Vanishing Man in Pursuit of Veliquez and a Face to the World on Self-Portraits and on Chapel Sands, My Mother and Other Missing Persons, which has been shortlisted for six literary awards in which she takes a closer look at her family story and tells the story of a book hailed as a modern masterpiece. William Dalrymple is the best-selling author of in Xanadu, City of Jinns, From the Holy Mountains, Age of Kali, White Mughals, The Last Mughal, Nine Lives, Return of King, and Kohinoor. His new best-selling book is The Anarchy, The Relentless Rise of the East India Company, and Forgotten Masters, Indian Paintings for the East India Company. William Dalrymple is also one of the founders and co-directors of the Jaipur Literature Festival. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it into the comment section. Do also follow our handles, JLF Lit Fest on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to get notified on the upcoming sessions. In case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. And in case we drop off, which we may well do, please hang in there and we'll be right back on Facebook. Ladies and gentlemen, on Chapel Sands, my mother and other missing persons, Laura Cumming, in conversation with William Dalrymple. Laura, welcome. How are you? I'm very well. Are you well in Delhi after your earthquake? We, we had an earthquake yesterday. We had uh, locust storms threatening us the day before. But uh, if this is the apocalypse, I rather like it. it break up. <laughs> you, look, you look very well on it. <laughs> Uh, we should say to um, everyone listening in that, that we go back rather a long way. You had to edit some of my very first ever, if not the very first published piece. <laughs> when we were very young. <laughs> when we were in, very young, in a literary there. review. A literary review, bless it, yes. Yeah. And we haven't seen each other for a very long time. And we don't look any different, do we? <laughs> as, a, as our pro mutual proprietor on these occasions. Laura, I mean, you. I should say, um, as an introduction here, that um, this book, you know, the properly astonishing book, hailed everywhere as a modern masterpiece. What's perhaps most extraordinary about it is that it's a kind of new genre. It pulls together different forms: the who done it, the family memoir, um, art observation and criticism. Um, and it's been hailed universally as, as one of the most extraordinary uh, non-fiction books written in recent times. So um, we were very sad not to have you at Jaipur in January. I know you couldn't make it, uh, I but this is a very nice, uh, it's a very nice reward, lockdown reward for us all to get you get you now. Shall we open, Laura, with you maybe reading the the, the elusively beautiful opening to your book? I'd be delighted. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome, Willie. I'm very grateful. Um, this is the opening of uh, what is actually a very short book in which I wanted to distill 
as much as I could what is really the whole of my life's thinking about this strange thing that happened to my mother and which changed the nature of my mother's life and mine and I think to some extent that of my children so three generations um this is the beach the book is set on this beach this is a photograph of my mother when she was a little girl um and perhaps if you keep that image in your mind of a child on a long beach so chapter one begins very short this is how it began and how it would end on the long pale strand of a lincolnshire beach in the last hour of sun the daylight moon small as a kite in the sky far below a child of three was playing by herself with a new tin spade it was still strangely warm in that autumn of 1929 and she had taken off her plimsolls to feel the day's heat lingering in the sand beneath her feet short fair hair no coat blue eyes dressed to match that was the description later given to the police She'd come out of the house that afternoon and along the short path to the beach with her mother, Mrs. Vida Elston. They'd already been there for some time with biscuits in an old tartan tin, digging and sifting the sand. The tide was receding when they arrived, the concussion of waves on the shore gradually quietening as the day wore on, and by now the sea was almost half a mile in the distance. In this lull, on their own familiar beach and so comfortingly close to home, Vida must have let her daughter wander free for a moment, for she did not see what happened next. Someone moved swiftly across the beach and began talking to the little girl, someone she perhaps knew because no sounds were heard as they coaxed her away. One minute she was there, barefoot and absorbed, spade in hand. Seconds later, she was taken off the sands at the village of Chapel St. Leonard's, apparently without anybody noticing at all. Thus was my mother kidnapped. I wanted to open uh, with that reading, partly because it sets the whole scene of this book and it's the core mystery behind it, but also because um, I'm sure that anybody, uh, any visitors to the Jaipur Literary Festival will have heard from the tone of it that it is something a possibly a little proximate to fiction. It might sound like the opening of a novel, and I intend it to do so. I want you to be drawn into this day, as, as you said, nearly a century ago on this balmy afternoon in the autumn on an English coast, and I want you to think of it as being a bit like the beginning of a, a story, because it is a story, the whole thing is a story, and the, the book is about the fact that the stories we tell each other that have been passed down to me and to my family may not be true. However, this one absolutely is true, and every single word of it is true. So the passage I've just read is all non-fiction. Every detail there I know to be completely factually accurate from the police report to the time of the day, to the conditions on the beach, all of these things are um, based in total fact. What happens after that starts to become more complicated. When you began working on this, did you reread Truman Capote, or what? What? What was it? Was it more? Was it fiction or non-fiction that you had in your head when you were beginning to pull this together and work out well, how to write it? What an interesting question. Nobody's asked me that. Um, I, I think actually what I was doing at the time was playing a lot of Cluedo. I don't know whether anybody in India also <laughs> plays the game of Cluedo, but if you recall on the Cluedo board, this famous Cluedo this is a, board. This is a very hot uh, tip for any writers out very there. Very hot tip, before yeah. You, before um, you begin have, your new non-fiction book. Play Cluedo, play Cluedo. And on the board of Cluedo, this mystery game where you have to work out who killed who, as I'm sure you all know, but there's a billiard room and there's a, you know, there's the kitchen where the, where the cook is living and so on. And this game, which I was playing with my children because we loved it, um, had been much in my head because in this tiny, tiny village, just a fraction of coastline. There were only 400 people living in this really quite poor village. Um, they are all farmers. Some of them just are farming their garden, really. Um, there are three cows, two sheep. You can, I think, picture this. On the dune, high dune, looking down over the sand is one 
huge house. And the huge house to me is the house from the Cluedo board. So it is literally a house that had a billiard room and a, uh, and a tennis court and so on. And in it lived uh, the people who are partly the villains of this story. And they are people from the Raj in India. And they come to, they have been living in India for many years and they have made so much money, I'm sorry to say, that they have built loot, this house. Loot, the village, loot, exactly. And um, they turn out to be related or not related, it is very hard to tell, to my mother. And her whole life, um, from the age of three when she moves into this house, important clue, you heard me saying that she was three on the beach, she's only three years old, and she doesn't go to live with these people, the Elsons, until she is three, which is very significant, you may think. And the people in the big house turn out to be, or aren't, it's not clear to me in my childhood, they were always presented to me as her aunts and uncles and very wealthy families who um, still were trading, in fact, in Delhi. So <laughs> it was a lot of connection for me um, with, with India. And one of the huge clues for me in the story comes in the form of a very beautiful um, trunk that was made in Madras and it had a beautiful striped lining and it was the most exquisite thing and I grew up with this trunk as being a very beautiful object in our house and it had initials painted on the side of it and I thought the initials belonged to one person and by the time I came to the end of this story I discovered they belonged to something somebody else and the whole story of who my mother was, who took her from the beach, who really were her parents, who were these people who lived in this grand house. All of these stories um, were told to me in a particular way and by my mother, who is an artist, and she even painted little images of the people in this story. And a fabulous and writer in her own right. Fabulous. Well, I'm love love you for saying that Willie because that's what I feel myself but she's a, a wonderful writer and the, the thing that Willie's referring to is is a sequence of little vignettes little stories of the figures in this tiny village so it's a bit like a fairy tale that part of my life I was brought up being told about you know the farmer who used to cycle these two two poor old cows along the road, you know, and he never got off his bike and he never walked and he always had a fag butt in his mouth and, you know, a defunct cigarette and so on. And um, these villagers, Lily Bodice, who ran the draper's shop in the village, which actually sold bodices, you know. It, all can't, of it can't be the real name. It has to be but a normal it name. It was. And, of course, I thought it couldn't be the real Lily name. Lily Bodice. The, the Lily Bodice, Bodice the draper, exactly. Um, and I... I I didn't really know if it, I mean I assumed it was all true and to my amazement it was so I found Lily Bodice and I found the I mean they were long since dead because this story as you know takes place a long time ago but uh, I wanted all my life to know really what had happened to her and I didn't want to dislodge this story too much in case it hurt my mother but I always knew that she had a point beyond which she would not go. So she didn't want to know, really. It, it, it was a source of great pain. Her childhood was spent, and this is the most extraordinary detail for me, um, living in this dark little, um, it's basically a Victorian, little narrow Victorian house, you know, with an outhouse, um, no bath, you know, and so on. And um, there's a garden, and in the garden is a tall tree with a swing, and you're already, I'm sure, all of you picturing this, that she's on her swing and as the swing reaches its zenith, she sees over the top of this high wall and she sees the man on his bicycle with the, you know, the cows and so on. And the only sense that she has of the outer world is really from the swing. And I hope it's going to be a film, Laura. We have to have oh, the I film. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish. With the but camera, with the camera on the swing. <laughs> with the camera on the swing. Because they saw her. You, you make the right point there, because I, I um, when I wrote the book and published it first, um, I didn't know whether anyone alive could remember any of this because it was so long ago. I had many letters from this village um, and people actually could remember seeing her figure, the figure of my little mother going up on this swing and so on. So she doesn't escape what is effectively a kind of prison until she's about 12 years old. And now I'd like you to picture another little scene. Um, she eventually, she's very clever, my mother, she gets a scholarship 
to a good school and the school is at a, um, a town called Skegness um, on the Lincolnshire coast. Uh, which is famous for having, you know, fair having, having bracing, bracing yeah, beaches. Yeah, absolutely. And um, she gets to, to this school. She gets finally. She gets out of this prison on in this tiny, tiny village. And the radius of her life grows by seven miles. And she's allowed to go on a bus to school and see that the world is not as she knew it. There are happier people. There are people who are allowed out. There are people with friends and so on. And on the on the day that she comes back when she's about, she's just turned 13 and she's on this little bus, a single decker green bus. Again, from the era of the Cluedo game, very Agatha Christie, if you can picture that, little sort of English villages, you know, up and down the coast. And she's on this bus and- It does have an Agatha Christie quality. It certainly does. Yeah. Oh, very, very deeply for me, which is where I think where the Cluedo board came in, because I always associate Cluedo and, and Agatha Christie. Colonel Mustard. And, yes, Colonel <laughs> Mustard and, you know, yeah, um, Reverend Green and Professor Plum. And she's on, a, on the bus travelling home from school and the bus is already a very anxious thing for her because if she doesn't catch the only bus, she has no way home, really. And her father, who is the tyrant of this whole story, will become volcanically angry. So she always has to run for this bus and she's only ever got four minutes to get to it. And what happens if the maths lesson goes on too long and so on. So she gets the bus. And on this particular day, she's sitting at the back of the bus full of school children all going home. And there's an old lady wearing black clothes, long black clothes. You have to picture uh, early 1930s. And uh, she comes up to my mother and she says to her, your grandmother wants to see you. And my mother doesn't have a grandmother and is immediately terrified. And the, the way that you asked me this question, Willie, about what had I been reading, it's much more what, what was I looking at all the time for me for this book, because my day job- I'm playing Cluedo with, with your bookshelf behind you, Laura. I can see, <laughs> see Paul, Robert <laughs> McFarland and <laughs> Rob Hughes, all your non-fiction <laughs> behind. No, no, not much <laughs> fiction there at all, I'm afraid. Anyway, the, the, the thing that the woman on the bus does is she holds up a, a tiny photograph, really not much bigger than a, a stamp, and the sh picture shows my mother, tiny. So how does she have this photograph, this stranger? How does she have this photograph? And my mother goes home to her family in this little house and says, terrified, this dreadful thing has happened, and... Um, you know what's the explanation and they tell her it's a the whole of this book is filled with bicycles uh they tell her to go out on her bicycle and cycle up and down and just go away and when she finally comes back several hours later they inform her these two parents of hers inform her at the age of 13 that she's adopted which is a huge shock um and it's not a shock that comes with any kindness or love so they don't say, and you know, we always wanted you and we were always waiting for you and you have made our lives filled with joy. They just say, uh, you were in trouble and you needed help. So we took you in. So at this point, my mother's life really splits and she no longer feels that anybody wants her or loves her. And the terrible fact is that what they were telling her was not really true. And for this, I have never been able to really forgive my grandfather, who is the the, as I say, the sort of villain of this story. But then, again, it's all about photographs. My mother, who had never really seen any pictures of herself, has a photograph taken in a little studio in about, I think about 1938. Um, and um, she suddenly sees herself objectified as an image. And we live, of course, in this age where we are all talking to each other on these screens and we all roughly know what we look like. But if you can recall a time when you didn't have a phone or a computer, all you had was a mirror or a reflection in a bit of glass or somebody else's photograph and not very many of them. And she had almost none. There were no mirrors in her house and hardly any photographs of her. So when she saw this picture, aged now, I think, 18, and had a sort of resolved, clear, defined image of what she actually looked like, she realised that she did look actually very like one of her parents. So I won't spoil the mystery by telling you who it was, but <laughs> so her life by now consists of having had photographically another life before she was three 
and different parents at 13 and now other parents all together again. And all of this is to do with images. So I'm just going to hold you up. This is the book that makes this story. There um, it is. Very Snapshot. old snapshot book. And maybe people listening will remember having photographs as small as this yeah. on the album. Little tiny. Um, so I would go back to this book over and over again, and I would try to think what happened, what happened. And I began to realize that my way of writing this story um, was, of course, as any of you would, um, to go and research documents and letters and ask people questions and so on. But for me, it's a game and the police report exactly, which is terribly hard to find because it was written in 1929 and it was written on a in ink you know in a an old fashioned handwriting a beautiful sort of copper plate scroll and not even typed you know um so to find that was quite hard and eventually i had to pay someone quite a bit of money for that <laughs> but there's so the, the story is operating through images and i began to think of things that i hope that we my, with probably all of you have already done this, but I hadn't really. I used to think to myself, why are there no pictures of my mother in that black book before the age of three? Why are there no pictures of my mother after the age of 13? You did you... In the bus. Did you, did you get onto that pretty early on, the absence of the early... Yes. yes, but the thing I didn't think about was um, you under you heard me saying that my my grandfather George was very much the villain. He was a tyrant. He had a terrible temper. He had a dreadful bronchitic cough. He was always angry. He was imprisoning. You know, he was a he was a travelling soap salesman, uh, and he went off with his heavy bag. You know, on a on a Monday morning, came back on a Friday, and my mother always used to say, "Well, the time when he was away was the peaceful time. When he came back, it was you know, hellish." So. I, I thought about him more. I want to uphold my mother's story. I love my mother. I want to uphold her story. However, can it be so simple? Whose story is? Which of us talking now? All of us know that if anybody actually wrote our lives for us, we would stop and say, that's not what it was like at all. Um, you haven't understood me. You know, what do you know of my inner life? And I thought about this man and whether he had really been the tyrant or not. And I began to notice that he never appears in the pictures. So obviously he's taking the photographs, right? He must be taking the photographs. Um, there's, it's, uh, they're very small. They're being taken on a box brownie. Um, it's a standard way of taking photographs. They're very good photographs, strangely good photographs. So maybe he's more interested in photography than one knew, but he's not in them. He's never shown with his daughter except in one. He's never shown with his wife except in one. And so who's taking these pictures? Why are so few people in them? Um, when we look at photograph albums, we all do this. You know, where is Uncle John? Why is he not here at Christmas? Um, what has happened to our cousin? Um, Who's that person there? I have no idea. I have myself looked at my own wedding photographs and thought, <laughs> who are these people? There's a man standing next to me in one of them and I don't really know who he <laughs> is, you know, and I was there. So, so I thought about this a, a lot. And I, if I may, I would like to show you a particular photograph from the book. Um, it also relates to India. Um, and I think you're probably going to see this picture on the screen in a second. Um, but if you don't, I'm just going to hold it up there as close as I can. And even that very close, I mean, it's only on a screen and hard to see for everyone, I know. But my immediate thought on seeing this, I, I'm, my job is, to, I'm an art critic. My immediate thought on seeing this picture has always been, it's a Vermeer. It looks like a Vermeer. Well. The light, the perfect light. Light and the woman, you know, like the milkmaid in Vermeer standing by yep. the window. So, um, I don't know whether anyone can see this very close, but on the table is this little theatre of objects. And I've looked at it so many times and I know what the objects are. The teapot is from India. One of the bowls is from India. You know, these are connected with that house on the hill. Uh, so that house on the hill has more to do with this story, I've always thought. So looking at this picture, I would think, what an amazing photograph. It's it's a very beautiful image. Now, he was a travelling soap salesman. It was taken in 1904 in Bradford, 
in the north of England in a two up, two down, tiny terraced house. He had no money. This was taken with a very, very special camera. How? How? Where did he get the camera from? How did he take the photograph? And he could never have seen a Vermeer. There were no paintings by Vermeer in Britain at this point. And that's so definitely not a box brownie photograph. It's definitely not a box brownie photograph. And um, I put it down now for the moment, but I really want people to, to think to themselves, well, that's a mystery already. How did he take this photograph? So I think about it and I think about these people in the house on the hill who have all this money. So I go and inquire and I know that they have photographs taken in the same period that are in that scale and format. And they're supposedly related. Maybe he borrows the camera from them. Whoever gives him the camera, he takes the most beautiful photograph. How? Uh, I mean, he's just this uneducated man who left school at 13. It's a wonderful photograph. So I took this image to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London and to the photography department. And they said, that's amazing. It could, it's, it's possibly a daguerreotype, which is really a very, um, with a huge, heavy glass plate camera. And they all said, you know, who's the artist? Who's the artist? He's a traveling soap salesman and now he's an artist. And so I love this uh, image <laughs> and I love the story because the next thing I did was to put, and I love Twitter and the internet for research. I put this question up with the image on Twitter. I don't know how many of you use Twitter or, or how Facebook or, anyway, I put it up and 50 million people wrote to me saying it was taken using this camera and he's standing here and so on. And they all argue about it. It was wonderful. And then a spy, an actual spy, he, he is indeed a spy, whose name I do not know, but I know where he lives and what he does. And he sent me a, 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 what they call a reconnaissance photograph where he drew in laser lines to show where the camera is, where my grandfather is, how he has controlled the light using a piece of muslin on the window. Um, what is going in the, and he even sent me a pattern used to make the dress. And I went and looked at this pattern and sure enough, as he said, your grandmother could sew brilliantly. She's adapted the pattern beautifully with buttons. She's, she's creative too. Already, and I now finish with this photograph, but already you can see this story is not as simple as it seemed. Uh, are we, I think we might, might be allowed a little bit more, a little bit more, Laura, the, what, what happens next? Or the, well, or um, at, least your, at least your pursuit of it. So how did, so how did you follow the story? You, you're alerted to inconsistency. How did you, and, and were you thinking of writing a book at this point or was it just you no. trying to work out your family? No, I just spent years being very, very angry with all the people involved and thinking, uh, because I did know that she had been kidnapped. My mother didn't know she was kidnapped until she was 60. Um, and, and she did not know who'd kidnapped her. But you, in the reading that I gave at the beginning of this um, festival event, the, uh, you heard me say that there was no sound on the beach. Nobody intervened. Nobody saw anything unusual. Nobody heard anything. So my sense was always that whoever took her knew her. And uh, so Agatha Christie. Me, yes, for <laughs> sure. And, and just simple intuition. I mean, I'm not really with this story. I'm not doing anything exceptional at all. Everybody listening to this could do this. Um, and I hope would. I mean, I feel our, our family stories deserve to be examined and not just shoved into the past, because in my own case, certainly they have influenced my my whole attitude to life so i i go and i i, I go and uh, visit the villages involved and i go around and talk to elderly people um many of whom remember some of these events and all of whom remember the kidnap and they all say nothing more tea nothing nothing and um everybody involved the, the adults involved in this story were all dead by now so there was no injury to anyone but there was a legal case and they were, I think, all rather touching me. I think they were all afraid that there was still some possibility of a lawsuit or something happening or the police being involved or, or possibly they were afraid of hurting people. I don't know. This is the best perspective I can give you. But actually, I was furious and I still am actually quite angry with all of them <laughs> because 